Hey, good evening and welcome everyone to our first digital history seminar this year. Um, it's a great honor to introduce Gabor Mihari Tooth, who is our prize winner for this year of the Deswat Prize. Um, I'm going to hand over first to James Baker, um, who will explain the, the setup of what we're going to do today and about the, the prize. Um, and I hand over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and good evening, all of you um, online. So um, roughly two years ago, I had the pleasure of chairing a really wonderful paper as part of this seminar series from Harry Raffle, who some of you all know, who gave a paper from the Royal Air Force Museum, who gave a really wonderful paper on virtual reality and historical understanding. I also started that seminar, which was the first of our um, 10th anniversary of the Digital History Seminar, by sharing the really terrible news that in that, the July of that year, we'd lost Richard Swart. Um, Richard was the founding convener of the IHR Digital History Seminar, and at the time, um, after talking to colleagues, I described him thus, as a friend, at a stalwart, an after seminar pub trip organiser, at the kindest and most, more, most generous seminar convener, and the writer of the longest and most, th most thoughtful emails, a man who always had time for us, perhaps too much time. Um, he remains, Richard, I think, all of those things to many of us, and then as now, his death certainly still pains me, especially in this space, a space that we regularly inhabited together um, in the IHR. Um, but from that awful moment, something good happened. Um, the Richard Tassoir Prize in his memory um, was founded, and last year we celebrated its first winner, or indeed winners, um, Joris von Einarten and Pip Haunen for their paper, Something Happened to the Future, Reconstructing Temporalities in Dutch Parliamentary Debate. Um, Joris and Pim were both kind enough to join the judging panel for this year, and together with the rest of our wonderful judges, who I will go through, um, Freya Howard, Herben Zagsma, um, Grace DeMayo, Jane Winters, Matt Philpott, um, Nadine Zubair, Peter Webster, and Tessa Hauserdahl, as well as Billy Taydell, who I nearly forgot, um, we selected the winner of the 2023 prize, um, the paper Studying Large and scale behavioural differences in Auschwitz Birkenau with simulation of gendered narratives. Of course, by our speaker today, um, Gabor Toff, but also his um, collaborators, Tim Hempel, um, Prisha Soman Dipali, and Sri Nara Yanan, um, a paper that was published um, in Digital Humanities Quarterly. Um, our decision was really tough, um, but Gabor and his colleagues were worthy winners um, in a field of work on topics that range from early modern texts and 20th century algorithmic verse to forensic investigations of born digital archives. Um, as Peter Webster, chair of our judges, who's also on the call tonight, wrote his remarks um, on the judging this year, he said, in its second year, it's a pleasure to see the Smart Prize once again highlighting the strength, diversity, and liveliness of the field. Richard Wood, um, I feel sure, have been delighted by it. The same, I hope, is true of our gathering tonight. And before I hand over to Tessa to introduce um, Gabor and his paper, um, please join me in congratulating Gabor and his colleagues on the prize. Real physical certificate. And um, I will be sending ones out to his collaborators. Thank you. Um, Congratulations. Thank you very much. So without actually that much further ado, I'd like to obviously hand over to Gabor, um, who uh, won this year's prize for his article published in the Digital Humanities Quarterly on studying large scale behavioral differences in Auschwitz-Birkenau with simulation of gendered narratives. Um, so Gabor is going to speak for about 20, 30 minutes, I believe, and then we'll have obviously some time for questions um, from the audience or also here online. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the prize. Voices of Solidarity from Auschwitz Birken now. Throughout the years, I grew up with testimonies of Holocaust survivors. I encountered many difficult stories, but there was one story I could never forget. And this is the story <coughs> of the little ballerina. As we were standing around waiting for our dresses, the SS became very restless and the block sister wanted to distract them. So she told them that she has a talented ballet dancer and that they want to dance. They agreed that they wanted to dance. And as she was dancing, 
Tears ran down her cheeks, for she remembered the times when she was dancing on stage, that the applause to an audience and to the pleasure of her parents. And now she was dancing in this God-forsaken place, like in San Marino, that there were only dogs and SS watching her. When you receive the addresses, they took this beautiful child with them, and we never expected to see her again, because when they took somebody away, they usually killed them, and we never saw those people again. But they did bring her back three days later, and we couldn't even recognize her. She had been raped, and she had been tortured, and she was like in a daze. She didn't know that she has to get up in the morning to stand the roll call. And if somebody would have been missing, and if they would find her in the bunk, then she would be beaten to death. So I would pick her up and take her between me and my sister. She should stand. And then we would watch over her that she should get her portion of food. The story of the little ballerina is not finished here. However, I'm sparing you from the horror of the rest. Today, I would like to highlight the last sentence we heard. I would pick her up, take her between me and my sister. She should stand and then we would watch over her and then she should get her portion of food. The story of the little ballerina is a remarkable episode that tells us about the solidarity in Nazi death camps. Since the end of the Second World War, tens of thousands of oral history interviews with survivors have been conducted. In these interviews, survivors do speak about solidarity and social interactions in concentration camps. Careful readers have also noticed that women are particularly likely to recall solidarity and social interactions. This led some historians to conjecture that solidarity and social cohesion were stronger among women than among men. Men and women were often detained in different sectors. Nevertheless, as an eminent historian has pointed out, this is just an unproven hypothesis. Statistical analysis has shown that the mortality rate of female prisoners was frequently lower than that of males. This has led to the hypothesis that women were much better equipped to withstand the awful conditions because solidarity among females was greater and they were less likely to succumb to the squalor of camp life. This is still a controversial subject. In the accounts of survivors from camps like these, there is no clear indication that an enhanced social cohesion existed amongst female prisoners. The eminent historian is right. Testimony fragments recalling episodes of solidarity in concentration camps can be best considered anecdotal. The heart of the matter is that history has no hands-on methods to construct evidence based on tens of thousands of testimonies. We cannot read or watch testimonies for thousands of hours. How can we go beyond the anecdotal? and construct historical evidence with computational models? This was the main research question of our paper. Today, I will walk you through the research procedure that we applied to tackle this problem. We had the opportunity to study 6,000 testimonies of Auschwitz survivors, testimonies of approximately 4,000 Jewish women and 2,000 Jewish men were included. These men and women were all in the Birkenau subcamp at the same time, between 1943 and the early 1945. Our goal was to investigate the hypothesis that solidarity was stronger, stronger amongst women. First, I will present the data set we worked with. Second, I will give a very gentle introduction into the methodology we applied. Third, I will present our results. In the conclusion, I will come up with two open questions that we can address in the discussion. 
The 6,000 Auschwitz testimonies we worked with were provided by the U.S. Shoah Foundation. The foundation has been conducting oral history interviews of testimonies with Holocaust survivors since the early 1990s. Over 30 years, highly trained staff of the foundation manually attached topic words to every minute of every testimony. So on the right side, you can see the consecutive minutes-based segments of an interview, including topic words. The topical annotation helps researchers and students search testimonies. Where are the topic words coming from? The foundation also elaborated a comprehensive topical dictionary or thesaurus. This aims to cover all possible topics that survivors address in their testimonies. The topical dictionary also includes themes referring to social life and acts of solidarity. For our research, the Shaw Foundation reproduced all topically annotated testimony segments that are related to Birkenau. In these segments, those who were in Birkenau discuss their life in the camp. In our data set, each survivor testimony is a sequence of topics. So you can see up there an example. Topics referring to solidarity and social interactions include, for instance, aid giving, food sharing, cultural activities, and friendship. Our hypothesis was that in testimonies of women, topics related to solidarity and social interactions are much more important than in testimonies of men. Women are significantly more likely to discuss these topics when telling about their life in Birkenau. And this leads to a technical question. Given thousands of sequences of topics, how can we discover the importance of each topic? To explain the solution we elaborated, I have brought an illustrative analogy. Here you can see the map of an imaginary country named Minat. Each node is a town in Minat. We can count how many people live in each town. However, intuitively, we feel that counting the number of people living in a town does not express its importance. To give the importance, we need to take into consideration a number of additional factors. How the town is connected with other towns. How much traffic is going towards the town. And the chances that if a random person starts a journey in Minet, she or he will go through the town. In short, we need to observe how the community is using or is moving around in this imaginary country. First, we need to have access to many single trajectories or journeys of people. Next, we need to synthesize the single trajectories to form a community. And finally, we need to observe the special movement of the community as a whole. We need a community-driven and bottom-up approach. It is also interesting to compare how different communities, such as, for instance, women and men use the same space. Perhaps women and men tend to take different trajectories, and the towns are not equally important for them. As a next step, let's do something bold, and let's replace towns with topics. And let's say that Minat is not a geographical space, it's not a country. It is a narrative space. In this narrative space, people can still make journeys and walk around. However, walking around means telling a story. Each story is a sequence of topics. So look at the first example, story one. Story one is a sequence of topics B, C, A, and D. This is also a journey or a narrative trajectory in Minet. Now remember that in the testimony data set we have, each testimony is a sequence of topics. So we can actually consider each interview as a book in a narrative space. Now after all, let's go back to the problem of importance. When studying the importance of a given topic, food sharing, we need to take into account how food sharing is connected to other topics, how much traffic is going towards food sharing, and generally, what is the probability of a narrative trajectory reaching the topic of food sharing? 
Again, what do we need? We need many single trajectories. We need to synthesize them to form a community. Then we need to observe how the community is moving around and using the narrative space. Again, we need to hear the voice of the community. Of course, we have two communities, men and women. We need to compare how men, men and women use the same narrative space. Now, after all, let's see how we implemented all this. First, we extracted all topics discussed in the 6,000 testimonies. We constructed a narrative space. Metaphorically, each topic is a town in this space. Then we, regard, we, then we regarded each testimony as a walking in this space, in the narrative space. As a result, we had thousands of single trajectories by men and women. Second, we synthesized the trajectories of men and women and constructed two communities. Finally, with the help of the Markov state model, we simulated and compared how the, co the, the two communities are using the same space. In practice, the simulation helped us calculate the probability that men and women will touch on food sharing, friends, aid giving, and so on. The simulation also helped compare the typical narrative trajectories men and women take before and after discussing these topics. So today I'm focusing on the probability. In the paper, we also pre present the trajectory analysis. So I'm showing you the process of simulation with the help of our two example, Minet. So how does the community use this narrative space? What is the probability that the journey will cross topic F? To answer this question, we synthesize many trajectories in Minet. So let's now do the simulation of the synthesized trajectories. Here you can see the simulation. You can see how a random person representing the community is moving around in Minet. As you can see, this is just a random process and nothing stable or firm is emerging. So next, let's also measure the probability of crossing topic F. At the beginning, it is changing a lot. But then something remarkable is happening. The probability of crossing topic F is stabilizing. It is not changing anymore. So what is going on here? Why is it not changing anymore? So our simulation reached a stable state or equilibrium state. In simple terms, this means that we have seen all possible ways the community moves around in Minet. We have also learned the long-term probability or the overall probability of each topic. And, and that's it. In the Markov state model framework, the overall or long-term probability is called stationary probability. The stationary probability is a very rich mathematical concept with a lot of meaning. Staying with our two example, the stationary probability of topic F expresses how much narration is going through this topic. The higher the, stay of the stationary probability of, of a topic is, the more traffic is going through that topic. The stationary probability also encapsulates the quality of links a topic has with other topics. Finally, the stationary probability of topic F expresses the chances that a random trajectory will cross this topic. And generally speaking, in computer science, physics, and chemistry, stationary probability is often used to measure the importance of a node, state, or a topic in our case. For instance, Google's original algorithm used the stationary probability to measure the importance of web pages. Now, after this, let's run some real simulation on the ten testimony data that we have. And let's compare the stationary probability of some key topics related to solidarity and social interactions in testimonies of men and women. Of course, when thousands of nodes of topics in our case are involved, we cannot rely on visualization. We can work only with plots such as the one you can see here. So the first topic is friendship. It is used to mark moments when survivors recall intimate social bonds. 
And as you can see, in case of women, it is much higher. The second topic is aid giving. It refers to memories when a survivor got help from someone or offered help. The difference is not so large, but it's still significant statistically. Food sharing is another key topic, referring to solidarity. The topic social relations refers to less intimate social bonds. We can see that women are more likely to discuss this as well. Finally, I put some signature topics by men. And as you will see, men are more likely to discuss, for instance, executions, violence, resistance, and then we will see beatings. Now to summarize, with the help of simulation, we could go beyond the single testimony or the anecdotal evidence. Metaphorically, we could hear the voice of two communities, women and men. The results demonstrate that women are much more likely to, to discuss key topics related to solidarity and social interactions. In, this, in their testimonies, these topics, these topics are significantly more important. By contrast, Men discuss other things, such as, for instance, violence, mass murder, healing, and forced labor. Most importantly, these differences between men and women are statistically significant. They are not due to chance. And this is what counts as evidence. Before concluding, I would like to reflect on these findings and evaluate them in light, in light of the historical context and the data set we have. First of all, we cannot forget about the fact that men and women did very different labor in concentration camps. Generally, hard physical work was assigned to men. And if you work 16 hours in a mine, it's quite understandable that you have no energy to socialize. However, women also did hard physical labor. And we compared testimonies of men and women who did similar types of work. We found that the difference between men and women remained consistent. Women who did hard physical labor are still more likely to recall solidarity than men who also did hard physical labor. We also compared men and women of the same nationality. Again, we found that the difference remained consistent. Second, we are in 1943-44. Most of the survivors whom we worked with were in their early, early 20s in 1944. Where are the young Jewish men <clears throat> in 1944? Most of them are doing forced labor or they are already dead. They were not deported to Auschwitz. Those men who were deported were the old and the very young. Unlike women in their 20s, old and young Jewish men had less chances to survive the initial selection process. As a result, the concentration of women of the same nationality was most probably higher. While women were often housed with women from their hometowns or home countries, men lived with complete strangers from other countries. And being surrounded by women from their home country, a woman could find solidarity and friends much easier than a man. To confirm this assumption, we would need to address another question. What did friendship, good sharing, aid giving, and so on actually mean for men and women? And this question points to the limits of the data set we have. In our data set, we had unified keywords or topics, which cannot account for the nuances of human relations and human behavior. Topic words have another limitation. Men and women might use different linguistic strategies to describe the same thing. Unified topic words hide the richness of human language. Unfortunately, we do not have transcripts and we could work only with topic words. Finally, we cannot forget about those 
did not give a testimony, or those who did not survive. The 6,000 survivors whose testimonies were included in, into our study are not a representative sample of those who were in their camp. It is just a random sample. What would have happened if these 6,000 persons had not survived and we had worked with other with testimonies of other 6,000 survivors? Would women still be more likely to discuss friendship, food sharing, eating, and so on? We address this problem with a specific statistical method called bootstrapping. And with high confidence, we can say that even if another 6,000 people had survived, we would have had the same findings. As a very short conclusion, we have found evidence that women survivors of Auschwitz-Birkenau are significantly more likely to discuss and remember about solidarity and social interactions. Does this mean that there was an enhanced social cohesion amongst women in the camp? Or does this mean that men and women remember about the past in different ways? I'm now concluding and leaving these questions open for the discussions. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Gabo. I think thank you very much. It's great. We have, I think, about half an hour for a discussion and question. I'm sure there are many. I'm sure there are many um, online and also here in the room. So we are going to, I guess, go back and forth uh, somewhat. Uh, for those of you who are joining online, uh, if you want to ask a question, if you could perhaps either indicate that in the chat or to raise your hand so we can see. Um, we can see that here, and then we'll um, take your questions in turn um, um, and mixing those with people here in the room who want to ask. Um, so if I, yeah. Okay, no, 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 it's a gentleman. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 so, so, um, can I just, I was, can I jump right in and kind of maybe ask a question that's not so much just my question, but I think is also the question that many of us judges had that we had when we were reading this paper and when we we're discussing it and when we agreed that um, you should receive the prize. And we did feel, of course, it's very interesting in the sense that it answers this historical research question and engages into this uh, debate around it. It does something really new and innovative. It is sophisticated, um, all of that. And many of the people um, then said, however, I have all these questions that it, it felt to many that it leads to more questions around historiography more broadly and even so broad as to kind of differences, as you said, between how do women and men remember, how do they express themselves and them. So we were left with, I think, so many questions as well that we felt almost the, the conclusion that you reached is um, perhaps almost secondary to the many other questions that you open up um, in doing this. So I was wondering how you approach this and how you how you grappled with all of these questions that you opened up and also maybe how you engage with um, scholarship around sort of oral history and what we can learn from oral history, how are there kind of, is there scholarship that speaks to this question around men and women, how they express themselves, how people remember the past, how we should interpret that. Did that somehow guide also your your thinking around this in some way? Okay. So, yeah. so I would like to talk a bit about this, these two questions. Was there an enhanced social cohesion among women in Auschwitz? Very common now. Do women and men remember about the past in, in, in different ways? And uh, my conclusion was that, that yes, most probably there was an enhanced social cohesion. And, and what, what made me believe this? And it's actually this I, I brought a slide about this is the bootstrapping. The bootstrapping is what, what absolutely convinced me that this was the case. So the bootstrapping method works in this way that uh, you have a sample of 6,000 men and women, and then you just randomly pick 100 women and 100 men, just totally randomly. 
And you ask the question, what would have happened if only these 200 persons had survived? What would we learn from that? So we run the simulation, we calculate this probability of the importance of different topics, and then we repeat this. And we keep repeating, keep repeating forever until we have seen everything. Now, how many combinations are there? You cannot even imagine the number of com possible combinations that you can, you can have. And what is the result of this? So let's say here is, here is food sharing. So this is the, the results. This is the, the probability that we get. And this is men and this is women. And uh, after this random process, and after running the random process, let's say 10,000 times, still we were unable to find any group of women and men where we would find that men speak more about food sharing. And this was a completely randomized trial. And this is what the gap shows there. There is, there is an enormous gap. So it's, it's not overlapping. So women will always uh, talk more, even if we, if we do this random process. And this is something that, that convinced me that, that the answer to this question is that, that yes, there was an enhanced social cohesion. Otherwise, why would women speak more about this topic? It might be that some women remember in a different ways, or some men remember different ways. But again, the random process is, is really is really, really convincing that there is no overlapping there. By contrast, in, in with other topics, let's say for instance, stealing, these two, sorry, these two uh, uh, parts of the plot are actually overlapping. So it means that it's, we can find groups where, where, for instance, men speak more about uh, about uh, let's say stealing than, than women and, and so on. So, so that's that's possible. So this was the thing that that, that convinced me about about this. And um, and the other question that do women men, men remember remember about the past in different ways? I, I don't think so. I, I think there, there is always there is always something in the past that that memory conveys. Memory in itself does not construct the past. And 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 it's again it, it can happen that 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 memory changes the way we things happen or the way we think about the past in some cases. But overall, I don't think that, that memory constructs the past. There is a certain degree of transparency in memory. So I, I don't think that, that this is that strongly related to memory. So that's uh, one of my answers. And um, what was the, sorry, what was the other question? And no, I think that was it. I think it was more this kind of sense that it, yeah, this, that it opens up so many questions where you, um, yeah, but I think you answered sort of my question to it. And as to the, to the language, I think you mentioned the, the yeah. language. Yeah. So yeah, the language is, is, a, is a very, very, very big, uh, big question and a big problem. But I was just thinking that, okay, if we, we had had the transcript, how would we have approached this, this entire problem? And I think we would have done the, the, the very similar thing, that we would have extracted topics from segments and then, then compare them. Because here there are, I don't know, at least 10 different languages are involved. And, and that's an enormously difficult thing to compare these 10, 10 different languages. So it's again, that for that reason, we would have used topic words. And that's a, that's a that's kind of necessity here. Yeah, I'm probably going to come over with a kind of cynical story question. Um, I'm saying this dramatically. Do you feel, I'm suspicious the degree to which this says anything about camps. You're suspicious, right? The degree to which this actually says anything about camps versus cultural constructions of gender in the mid 20th century more broadly. If you were to apply this method to something like the mass observation mm -hmm. testimonies, 
Which means that's what the mass observation testimony is. Mass observation. It's a project through most of the 20th century okay. where people write diaries out of the data. Okay. Okay. And you modeled in a similar way around the kind of high level concepts of collaboration, community, conflict, violence. Do you not think actually what you're what you're looking at is is a broader gender pattern? I think basically you need a control to, to determine whether this is telling you about the experience of the camps or whether this is actually telling you about gender more broadly and the cultural perceptions that these people are acting out, these people who are brought up and versed in a cultural set of values of what's acceptable, male and female ways of expressing and, um, and communicate. So it feels, yeah, that that's a very complex situation and how much this is just a broader picture of the era and gender, cultural values of gender, feels like it might actually be quite a big part of this. And kind of related to that, uh, these are testimonies which are video or oral testimonies. Mm -hmm. For the yes, oral testimonies. What is some of the impact of the interviews or the recorders? That's one of the big topics in, in oral history is thinking about the active role of the interviewer. If it's a man being interviewed by another man, will he say different things? So this is another control we could perhaps do. If it's a man being interviewed by another man, will he talk about different topics compared to if it's a woman being interviewed by a man, would a woman of the mid-20th century being interviewed by a man feel that she needed to conform to gender roles and therefore talk about those themes more than uh, the other way around? Sorry, it's a cynical question, but I'm trying to... to yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Thanks. So as to the control group, I agree that so that would have been good to have a control group some kind of control group so that's uh that's we did not include and that's uh, uh that's regrettable now but you you mentioned this project the diaries no or, or it's, so I, I think it's this is a bit fundamentally different because this is about one very 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 specific thing and then, then it's surrounded about around a specific experience specific space and time so so it's it's here there is there is a shared past, an absolutely shared past, uh, in terms of location and time. Whereas uh, what you mentioned, I think it's, it's it's much much broader. I mean, there, there are just many... one example. Yeah. But, um, yeah. 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 I'm so, sure there's yes, other sources. Yeah. 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 So, but I think I think that that counts really that these people were in the same place, the same moment, and 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 this this has an impact on the way they tell their stories and also what they tell about it. So I, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's important to, to say. Um, the role of the interviewer, yes, so that, that's an important thing. Uh, we did not get that information, so we didn't know who was the interviewer. The Shaw Foundation knows it, but uh, we, we did not know it. So we, we don't know what was the role of the interviewer. Nevertheless, um, my understanding is that, that the Shaw Foundation has a, has a very well defined protocol. What kind of questions they can ask, how the interview is going. So I think the, the interview protocol is somehow minimizing the impact of, of, the, of, the, of the interviewer. In an ideal world, each interviewer should do the same thing. They should have the same questions, they should go through the same process. It's not always the case. I've, I've seen testimonies where they're very, very rich, which is much more rambling, the other ones are less rambling. But in an ideal case, the, 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 the protocol is what, what really determines the entire process. Still, to, to which extent is, uh, is, the, is the gender of the interviewer impacting the person who, who is interviewed? It's yes, we don't know. So that it would be good to know, but we don't know. And, and that, that's something that I, I don't know if, if it were possible to, to extract or extrapolate from, from the testimonies we have. But 
Yes, I, I agree that that's that's a very important thing, and uh, and it's a uh, it's, it's a bit of a bit you could not include that. So I guess yeah. as was pointed to in the previous question about the historiography of all history, perhaps having work that you could pull upon. Yeah. In this respect. I, thank you so much. This is really fascinating. Just, I guess almost on the other side of what we just mentioned. Um, I know uh, sadly we have fewer and fewer survivors today, but um, I wonder if you've presented this work or this work or your research has been given to any of them or if there have been any responses from them because it would be very, you know, I think it would be very in not only interesting and I think very rewarding for some survivors who are, who are actively, you know, part of the kind of the, the memory of this, but also whether they might have some feedback, right? Because so much of this is based on memory. And I wonder also about the kind of the social role that we play as historians. And, you know, this is a very present and very kind of important, timely piece of, of research, whether, you know, you've reached out to, to, to kind of groups or, or kind of survivors and maybe what their responses have been. Yeah, so the answer is never. And we presented this to, to survivors. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've seen presentations where survivors were present and uh, the historians talked about it. And, and it's, it was always very difficult. It was always a very, very, very difficult thing. And, and I, when, I, when I saw these occasions, I never saw anything positive coming out of it. I don't know what survivors say about uh, about this. That's something that I don't know personally. But when I when I saw these occasions, they were they were quite awkward. So it's it's I don't know, but yeah, it's it's it would be an interesting thing to do, perhaps. In the sense that it was too painful for people to engage mm -hmm. with, it or no, there was when I saw it. I'm just remembering there was discussion, like like. Um, it was the point of the historian who has the, the hindsight of everything. And then there is the point of the survivor, and then the two, two things are not matching. And then there's a tension there. So that's why I felt that, okay, this is, this, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. But it's still, it's still an interesting thing. And to be clear, I don't mean it in terms of you benefiting from it in terms of your research, more that, you know, if we are going to be working on very, very painful memories and ostensibly profiting from the memories of survivors, do we then have a duty somewhat to give that back and to actually talk to them and you know foster some of that? You know, not so much like a presentation of, you know, this is what I've done, here is the statistical analysis, which I imagine is probably not of great interest, or well, maybe it is, but but more as that kind of sense of if we're working with very difficult memories and things that people yeah, have yeah, taken yeah, the time yeah, and yeah, yes, absolutely, to kind of absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions here. So um thank you. Um so you started with um the testimony of older girls taking care of a younger girl. Yeah. And at some point later, you talked about um, men and women and where, where they were displaced from, um, from different homes, different communities, different localities, presumably different countries in some cases, um, and certainly different cultures. Um, and it made me think about the kind of the intersections of gender and class and status um, and background that kind of make up identity and, and construct something like gender. Um, and so, my question then is, I guess, your you were this paper specifically is probing a hypothesis about gender. Um, and I, I'm I'm wondering the ways in which in your thinking you were bringing in the ways in which gender is made by age, by place, by class into your work. And I guess in a way, this is a kind of classic Richard question, which is sort of like, are you going to next look at the ways in which sort of the ways in which you thought about gender in a slightly binary sense maybe actually interacts also with a series of intersections between lots of different ways in which gender is constructed, sorry, gender is constructed, and in which the kind of the um, the memories you've analysed are pointing to certain potential ways of thinking about the differences in people's um, testimonies and potentially behaviours. Yeah, 
Does that make sense to the question? Yeah, uh, else. So the, the, the age here, I think it's quite homogeneous. I remember where I am. So the plot a few years ago, but the age is, is as I said, the vast majority of people are in the early 20s. So, so it's, it's, it's going to be really difficult to, to make comparison between age groups based on this data set. Um, as to the class, there was there were plans to work with class and to check, let's say, what was the what was the profession of the father, and then to, to go there, and and that some we did not do that, so we didn't go and look into into the classes. Um, as to culture, so these are all Jewish men and women, so they have a very strong shared culture. So the, the culture background is, is, is absolutely is, is shared here. And I, I don't feel like enormous differences between the culture of, uh, of, of different women. Let's, and even, even if you look at, let's say, the culture of, of Polish women and, and, and Hungarian women, they, they still have the same Ashkenazi Jewish background. But, now the, the, the religion, that was another thing that we, we thought about to look into to, to which extent religion is, 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 is playing a role here. So there, were, there, there are some people who were very religious and others who were not very religious. But in this regard, the, uh, the data we have is, is very, very fuzzy. So sometimes it says there are like six, seven, eight categories for, for, for the way the religion, the religious background of a person is described. And these are so inconsistent that, uh, that we decided, okay, we're just not going with this, with the religion. So the, so the cultural background is, is, is important, but uh, we, we cannot really cover it. So can I ask a quick follow-up then? So you chose a question ultimately, uh, a hypothesis, sorry, to, to probe that was about gender. So within the historiography of the field, which is not my expertise, are questions around gender and the different ways in which women and men interact in the camps um, prominent among those kind of questions and hypotheses that historians of these kind of memories are interested in? Or are there other kinds of questions that um, think of people in sort of different groupings, shall we say, or, or is that where philosophy I see, okay. I see. Yes, I, I think it is absolutely a prominent question, uh, given the fact that men and women often were in separate sectors. So, so it's, it's an absolutely uh, prominent question. And uh, and it's, it's as I said in the beginning, uh, this hypothesis has been around for a long time. It, it, it's not that uh, it was born uh, this the last year. So this, this has been around. And, and historians have, have felt this. Those who, who really listen to these testimonies, they, 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 they felt that there is a difference here. But as I said, it's, uh, it remains something that is anecdotal. And, and I think the, the, the first citation I showed, it's, uh, it's, it's very much, um, here it is, it it's really makes the point. On the other hand, it, it's also important to point out here that is uh, what is missing from here and I couldn't put the entire citation here because it's been too long but it's it's very important what's here and uh, practically Paul Pingel is saying that that uh, even though this hypothesis exists it is very 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 difficult to make valid comparisons because even within camps there were there were there were enormous differences. And I will just be briefly mentioned, like let's say the, the, the work, the type of work, for instance. So that's why we, we decided that okay, uh, we work with people who were really at the same place at the same time. Initially, we had around 13,000 testimonies, I guess. That's what we got from the Shah Foundation. And we ran the same procedure on the same on 13,000 testimonies. And we got very similar results. And I presented this to a uh, to historian, to a group of historians at USC. And they said, no, 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 you cannot do this. This is wrong. This is wrong you, because you are, you are comparing Apple with Carl or something like this. 
So that's why we decided to go only with, with people who were there at the same time and, and really at the same place. It would have been also interesting to see development or to compare different periods of the Auschwitz complex. So the Auschwitz complex was not, uh, it, it changed a lot over time. So that's, that's also very important to say. It changed, it had four or five different sectors. It changed, it changed, there was variation in terms of the sectors and it also changed over time. And then strangely, as the camp became larger and it became much more lethal, it's the, the discipline became more and more relaxed. So in 1943, 44, when, when this, these people were there, it's already not as harsh as it was before, actually. So that's, that's also very important to say. So it's less harsher. Not in terms of the number of people who were killed, but in terms of the entire environment. At least this is what historians say. And the, the last point is just also very important to say that, that we, we worked only with Jewish victims. We did not work with, uh, with Roma, Yehova, and so on. And that's, that was a practical thing. It was just in the Shaw Foundation's data set, in the very original, they said there aren't enough. There are only 10, 15, maximum 50, for instance, political prisoners. And that's just not enough. Can I ask a question that just sort of follows on from not my question, but something you said in there, which is interesting, which is you mentioned you, you presented some aspect of this work, a different version of this work, yes, to the USC, to historians. And yes. I, and um, I mentioned at the beginning that, of course, this, this paper is published in a digital humanities journal. And, and I'm curious about how you present this work to groups of historians, particularly historians who are experts in the field. Do, do you present this work in a very similar way to them, or do you actually um, talk, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah. how, yeah. how do you kind of communicate, because I mean, the paper itself, um, it fits in that space that I'm not necessarily sure a lot of historians would read it and find it necessarily something they can attach to, Yeah. Um, yeah so I'm wondering how you present that work to them, well, or maybe you're thinking about that and haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so this presentation took place maybe four years ago, so I'm, I'm not really, I don't really remember what's, how I presented it. I think the way we presented it, it was more like the plots were presented and then they were not convinced about it. So, said, okay, this is, this, is, uh, this is still shaky. And that was the point when, I, when we went for, for the bootstrapping that I showed that, that okay, we really need to make, make we need deeper evidence and then this to the random process, and then the random process was never presented again to the historians. So yeah, historians were, were quite skeptical about this. And uh, and how I would present it now, that's a good question. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, and maybe not in this way. And uh, so in, in today I, I was trying to to help people to, to have, a, have an idea of this methodology and then to, to, to be able to, to, to imagine what's going on here. But it's, uh, it's important to, uh, to emphasize that this is, this is just, so what we see here, so this is just a handy analogy to help you to imagine what's going on here. It's, it's not that we, we, we really think, we thought in terms of space like this, not at all. Not at all. So we, we really think about the model and how that is working. And this is this is more like helping people to, to imagine this and, and I hope that you could understand it a bit. It did help, I think. That's good to hear that. Can I ask you, Fanny? Oh, sorry, there's one from online. Um, there's a question from Peter Webster. Um, Peter, I'll, I'll just read that out if it's okay. So the question is, Gawa and colleagues have made a significant investment in developing a new method. Can you speculate about which other subjects this might be applied to? Are you perhaps already collaborating with others to widen its use? Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so this, this kind of, is this? So sequences, sequences of states 
is, is just ubiquitous in history. I mean, think about the life trajectories of people, think about migration of, of people, think about the ownership as the ownership of a company is changing from owner to owner. Uh, in the paper we are writing about object biographies, how objects are circulating. So, so these kind of sequences of states are, are, are data sets that can be modeled as sequences of states are, are ubiquitous. And I think this methodology can be can be used to study them. And that's that's where I, I see uh, a future use case. At the moment, uh, we don't we don't work on this, but uh, there is plan. One of the plans is actually studying the entire Shaw Foundation data set, which is uh, fifty some fifty two thousand interviews, and to look into all these questions in the context of other other um, camps. Is is this true with other camps? We don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. So so that's that's something that uh, that's that's planned. And then the other thing that's planned is, is, is to study the migration of people because uh, this data set is actually uh, helps us to reconstruct the complete trajectory of people. So like the idea, as I mentioned, the entire life trajectories of people. So then is, this is another direction that uh, we might take is to, 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 to find out uh, where did people go after the Second World War, where did women and men go, and, and what were the what were the factors that affected their decision to go to the U.S. to stay in Europe and so on? So that's they are the the, the directions for future research. Thank you. Um. Yeah, Peter's saying thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um. Can I finally ask you just to give us a sense also because I know some of your co-authors are also here, give us a sense of how you work together on this project because obviously there are several of you involved and sort of give us a sense, maybe a broad overview uh, of sort of how this, who who did what, how how did this all come about? How did you collaborate on this? And... Yeah, so it's just a um, brief summary of this, this project. Um, uh, I, I wrote for the USHO Foundation and uh, I met Shui, who is a professor of computer science at USC, and he has been active with the Shaw Foundation for, for I think for 20 years. He's a board member there, and he always wanted to do some research on it. So he said, okay, let's work on it. And that, that he hired me. And we started to work, and, and, and the work didn't go very well. Uh, we tried a lot of different things, and there was no real research question, and we were just trembling. And at some point, I approached the, the Shaw Foundation and asked them to, to share with us the testimonies of Auschwitz. And uh, we got the testimonies. And as a first step, I, I run a simple uh, descriptive statistic and analysis, and that immediately showed that there is something going on here in terms of the social life and solidarity. So I started to, to think about it and so started to think about how to how to work out a good methodology. And that's what we, we discussed with computer scientists, and we ended up with the Markov state model. And uh, the other culture team is a total accident. I mean, I was looking for a good library, programming library that can do this, it can, uh, with which we can use this model. And this library turned out to be a library of physics. And I, I asked a lot of questions from the, from the developers and he answered and somebody says, hey, would you like to collaborate with us? And I said, yeah, yeah, let's collaborate. And then, then we, we started to work on it. And that's more or less the way we did. And, and uh, Krishna was the lab leader of the lab, of Shri's lab, and and, uh, and uh, he practically advised us how to do it and, and to what to what to do, what are the problems, what other methods we need to take in, and so on. So in a nutshell, thanks. Story. <laughs> are there any other questions? Any anything from people joining online? Last 
Okay, in that case, yeah, it leads me to thank you, Gabo, thank you and to your co-authors. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's one of my thank you very much for this. Um, please come and join us also for our next digital history seminar on the 21st of November, if I'm not mistaken. It will be a postgraduate panel, so a very different thing. So this was our annual Desert Prize seminar. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for this interesting you, paper. Um, yes. Um, bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. Thanks.